I'm glad you could be here with us tonight. Uh, you know, a typical Good Friday sermon kind of leaves you feeling like you need to slither out under the door and feel pretty low. And I think that's appropriate when we think about the sacrifice of our Savior. But I also think that there's great joy in Good Friday. That's why they call it Good Friday, because our Savior died on our behalf, and we have much to be thankful for in spite of, in spite of the difficulty of the day. I want to come to this Good Friday from a slightly different angle. I want to talk more about the way Christ endured the cross rather than about his death. Slightly different angle. Job 5.7 came to mind for me. Man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. What does that mean? It means that every one of us in this life will experience trials and difficulties as part of our human existence. It is part of life in the same way, and it's a given in the same way that sparks go upward, uh, heat rises. It's never going to change. It's the way God designed it. And for us as well, suffering is part of human existence. And so this evening, what I would like to do is, is turn to First Peter uh, chapter 2 with you. And we're going to look at verses 21 to 25. And we're going to talk about how we as believers should follow Christ's example in enduring unjust suffering. Okay, so chapter 2 of 1 Peter, verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls." Now, the, the context of this passage, as you may well be familiar, is suffering. It's the suffering of the believers in the first century, right? Uh, but, but Peter here says, you've been called for this purpose. You see that there in verse 21? You've been called for this purpose. Uh, look over at chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, the context here, he says, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king or as the, as the one in authority. Uh, verse 20. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. This finds favor with God. Look over at chapter 3, verse 9. Peter says, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And then chapter 4, verse 1, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And then finally, verse 19, therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Clearly the context here is about submitting to the will of God in the midst of suffering, unjust suffering. How as believers are we supposed to respond to that? And Peter's answer is, follow the example of Christ. Follow the example of your Savior. So, Clearly, the purpose here is submitting in the midst of suffering. And even more specific than that, this passage is primarily directed at slaves and servants. You see down in chapter 2, verse 18, servants, be submissive to your masters. And notice the bold number next to it. And that context continues all the way through the end of the chapter. So primarily, by way of first interpretation, what we're saying is, 
that this passage is directed to slaves, that even though they're being harshly treated, unjustly suffering, that they can follow the example of Christ in that unjust suffering and that, and that they can entrust themselves to God's care. It's instructive for us, though, because over in chapter 3, notice the phrase, chapter 3, verse 1, in the same way, you see that? In the same way, wives, uh, if you're in a bad marriage uh, and your husband is an unbeliever and you're suffering in that marriage, you likewise can submit and you can submit yourself to God's will and you're enduring unjust suffering, but God is going to use it in your life as well. And uh, it applies to husbands as well, down in chapter 3, verse 7. You husbands, in the same way, if you're living with an unbelieving wife, uh, live with her in an understanding way. And, and then he kind of sums it all up in, in uh, chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Um, this is what it means to be a believer, beloved, is to submit, but more than just submit, submit even if you're being unjustly treated. Because the world is watching. The world is watching how you respond to unjust suffering, and they're watching your submission to God. Do you believe that God is sovereign? Because if he is, then there are no accidents, and every good thing comes from his hand. And that's Peter's point in all of this. This is the application of this is far and wide for us as believers. It doesn't matter what brought about the suffering, whether it be sin or whether it's from Satan's hand or it's the situations we find ourselves in or maybe it's even from saints. Uh, the point is that we all, as Job said, will endure suffering in our lifetime. Now look at verse 21. In particular... Uh, he says, Christ suffered, leaving you an example. I just want to focus on that for just a sec. The example is, is uh, in the Greek, it's the word hypogrammon. And what that means is, it's, if you ever taught your children how to write out the alphabet, it's the copy of the alphabet that they follow the instructions as to how to make the letters. And so it's that writing copy, if you will. And Jesus is our writing copy, if you will, as to how to endure suffering. And it says, in order that you might follow in his footsteps. That little phrase, in order that, that's a purpose clause. So Jesus is our writing copy. And the purpose that he set the example was that, that it's like he left tracks in the snow, if you will, like, like bloody tracks in the snow, an example for us to step in and follow after. So, I don't want to just talk about his death this Good Friday. I want to talk about the manner in which he endured suffering. I want to look with you at three ways in which Christ's cross work sets a model for us. It really does. It sets a model for us to follow so that we know how to respond to unjust suffering. It's not hard to figure out if you look at the text with me. Verses 22, 23, and 24, they all start with the word who, or some of you have a translation, he. So each of our three ways in which Christ's cross work was done, uh, Peter's three points all start with, he's an example, who did this, who did that, who did this. Okay? So that's, that's what we're looking at here. The first way that Christ suffered was sinlessly in verse 22. You see that? Sinlessly. It says, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Now, if you're looking at your Bible there, notice that it's in all caps. So what does that tell us? It tells us it comes from where? That's the Old Testament, folks. That's right. Uh, in particular, Peter has in mind Isaiah 53, 9, and that should come up there. Oh, there you go. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. It's a direct quote from the Old Testament. So, so not only did the suffering servant die on behalf of his people out of Isaiah 53, but he did it without sinning in the process. 
He was the perfect sacrificial lamb. And it's not just that Christ d died unjustly, it's that he, he died for the sins of you and I, and not for any sins which he personally had committed. He never sinned his whole life. He was executed as an innocent man. The word uh, sin is just a generic word for sin. He died without sin, and he died without deceit. Deceit is the idea of guile or, or treachery, or it, it, it's associated with uh, lies. So the point here is that he didn't die for sin generally, and he didn't die for sin specifically. He didn't die for sin at all on his part. He died for our sin our sin. And importantly, in this context, it's not just that he, he didn't sin his whole life. He didn't sin while he was going through the suffering associated with the cross. In this context, that's what it's talking about. While he was being led to the slaughter, he didn't retaliate. He didn't threaten. He didn't demand justice. He went silently. He went silently, and in the process, he did not sin. He did not sin. So what that means is the, the invalid trials, the, the beatings, the scourgings, the mockings, the crucifixion, he didn't sin against anybody who was hurting him. He didn't sin against anybody and say, you wait till I come back. I'm going to get you. Right? You just wait. I'm going to call down legions of angels, and they are going to crush you. There was none of that. He resisted sin. He didn't call them nasty names, right? He didn't make idle threats. He resisted sin under duress. He suffered sinlessly. Look at chapter 2, verse 20. Again, we, we read it earlier, what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. It's, it's not just suffering for sin, it's, it's suffering for righteousness' sake and enduring that suffering without sinning in the process. Uh, chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, the one who desires life... To love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. I have to do it. I hate to flip you around all over the place, but go back in your Old Testament to Psalm 34, 11. Psalm 34, 11 and following, because I want you to see here this psalm, Jesus ascribed to him, well, the, prophetically was ascribed to Jesus, I should say. Psalm 34, 11. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And here's what I, obviously, that is, that what we saw in 1 Peter is being quoted from this text, but what I want you to see is the context. Look at verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. See the context of that? Jesus died sinlessly, and he just entrusted himself to God's care. He entrusted himself to God's care. He just trusted that the Father knew what he was doing. The Father knew what he was doing. And some of you, you know, I know you're thinking, well, yeah, he's the Son of God. That's easy. That's easy for him, right? He can, he does, there was no way he could sin, so that's, that's a no-brainer, right? But no, look back at 1 Peter with me and just understand that he was God. He couldn't sin because his, 
his humanity was bolstered by his deity. But the point here is that we wouldn't be called to view him as an example of suffering if his suffering wasn't viewed as the sufferings of a man. He suffered as a man, and that's why he's our example. So, how do we avoid the sin in the midst of unjust suffering? How do we avoid sinning? Uh, You and I cave in to the sin of the moment like a styrofoam cup, right? We're quick to defend ourselves when we are wronged. Very quick. Uh, When there's no justification for somebody treating us unfairly, we rush to our own defense. Boy, we turn into Job in a heartbeat, right? Self-righteous, self-righteous. And, but, beloved, we sin in doing that. We question why God is allowing such things to happen to us. Why would you do this to me, God? Why are you tempting me to sin? It's the first thought that we have. Why is God allowing this? Well, I'll tell you why he's allowing it. Because he's promised that he would conform you to the image of Christ. And what is Christ? He's our example. He's our example. I have this quote for you here. It is and should be the care of a Christian not to suffer for sin nor to sin in suffering. I think those are wise words. You know, Satan himself is looking for a foothold. He's looking to exploit our weakness. Uh, You can see that over in chapter 5. Peter there says that Satan is... uh, he's prowling around, verse 8, like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Again, the context of this is in the midst of suffering, Satan is looking for an easy target. He knows you're going to cave. He knows you're going to cave if you're walking around in the flesh trying to do things in your own power. He's looking for a target. So what do we do? How do we overcome it? Well, Peter gives us some advice there in chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. He tells us how not to sin in the midst of unjust suffering. And the first one, verse 6, humble yourself. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. God is sovereign, amen? Everything comes from his hand, whether good or ill, And the problem is, we need to redefine what we think good is. That's the problem. It's perspective. Secondly, uh, you need to cast your cares on him. Uh, Give them to him. The word cast here is the idea of throwing. It's taking all of your concerns and like a garbage man, well, I don't know that they do that anymore. In the old days, garbage men used to actually lift trash barrels into the trash can, but it's kind of that idea. It's wham, throwing it in there. Wham, throwing your sin at God and allowing him to deal with it. Casting your cares upon him. All of your cares. Third, he he says, be sober. Uh, Be on the alert, right? Satan is looking around. So what that means is you need to avoid the trap of reactivity and instead focus more on proactivity. You need to be prepared. You need need to be prepared for those times when something is going to come upon you. It means preparing for war because war is going to come at some point. How many of you have ever suffered? Just raise your hand. Yeah, see, every one of you. Every one of you. It's part of your human existence. He says down in verse 10, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Uh, God has a purpose in suffering, and it's to conform us to the image of Christ. Suffering produces endurance. Endurance leads to maturity. And without that, if none of us ever suffered, our faith would be that big. 
James says the same thing, right, over in James. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when what? When you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. And let endurance have its perfect work, that ultimately you will be complete. Christ suffered sinlessly. Secondly, verse 23, Christ suffered silently. Christ suffered silently. Verse 23. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Now, silently in the sense, not that he didn't say a word, but that he didn't revile back. He didn't exchange insults for insults, blows for blows, nor did he threaten those who were mistreating him. That's the point. Now, both of those verbs in this verse are related to speech. They're related to speech. His speech was excellent, even while under duress. Flawless, perfect. When he was cursed, he didn't curse back. When he suffered, he didn't make any threats of retaliation. Now, ironically, if anybody could retaliate, right? If anybody could make a threat and keep it, it would be him. But he didn't even do it. Interestingly, I want you to turn over to Acts 23 real quick. Turn over to Acts 23, verses 1 to 5. I want to show you something. I've always admired the Apostle Paul. He's an amazing man. But even the Apostle Paul was flawed in this respect. Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit and try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? But the bystander said, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, oops, I was not aware, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it's written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And Paul realized what he had done. And so, again, submission, even Paul recognizes to submit to those in authority, right? And this is what Peter is after. Jesus did not threaten. He did not retaliate. He endured the suffering of the cross silently. And again, it's an an allusion to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. The silence of the lamb. The silence of the lamb. Interestingly, I I don't know the first thing about sheep, so I watched a YouTube video about this just to verify that it was accurate. And you know that if you take one of these sheep and you flip them over on their back, shearers, you know, when they're going to shave off their fur, whatever. (laughs) I know it's wool. I'm kidding with you. (laughs) So they flip them on their back and they start shaving them. but but, But when a sheep is flipped on his back, you know, he doesn't move. He just, he just lays there. As soon as you flip him back on his feet, he gets all agitated and starts to run around again. But then when they flip him back on his back again, <laughs> he just does this sort of thing. No bleeding, no resistance, no nothing. Again, think about the context of this passage. It's submission. It's submission. There's a resignation to the Father's will here. Uh, even to those who are shaving the coat off your back, if I could say it that way. <laughs> 
How does one remain silent in the midst of unjust suffering? How do we keep our tongue under wraps? Well, it says in verse 23, he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Uh, this, is, this is actually an imperfect verb. And what does that mean? It means it's past tense, but it's ongoing action in the past. So what, what that means is he, he kept on, ongoing past action. He, he continually entrusted himself. He, he gave himself over to. He committed himself to God, to the Father, to the one who judges righteously. And that, that phrase there, the one who judges righteously, I don't want to get overly grammatical on you, but it's a participle. It's not a noun. And what that means is that it more describes him as what he does rather than, rather than who he is rather than what he does, if I can say it that way. He's the righteously judging one. It's, it's talking about the character of God. Jesus kept on committing himself to the righteously judging one. That's how you keep your mouth closed in the midst of suffering. That's how you don't venture into that sin territory. That's how Jesus was able to remain silent. He apprehended and understood that God was in control and that everything that comes from God's hand is both good and perfect. And he was able to resign himself to God's perfect will. Up on the screen for you, 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9. He says, to sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Think about that with me for just a minute. This is a complete reversal here. This is not just now enduring suffering from those who are unjustly treating you. This is now blessing them in the process. Complete reversal. The only way that can be is if God is even sovereign over the evil motives of men. Get that in your head. Think about it for a little while. Meditate on that. God is sovereign not just over the good stuff in your life, but even over the bad stuff. Okay? And, and this is not a resignation like, I'm just going to stuff it. I'm just going to stuff it. I'm just going to tolerate it. This is not stuffing it. This is like Stephen in Acts 7, 59 to 60, right? They're stoning Stephen. He's dying his last breath. He's suffering unjustly for the gospel. He's trying to save these people, and they're stoning him. And what does he say to them? Father, don't hold it against them. Forgive them. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, the answer is here. How does someone get to the point where they bless their enemies instead of cursing them? Uh, first, I think they don't try to play God and judge their enemy. That's the problem, is that we put ourselves in the position of God and we think we know better than God. And rather than take what he gives us as his good and his best, we, we kick against the goads. We don't want it. We don't want to be uncomfortable. Secondly, uh, we see all things as coming from his loving hand for our good and his glory. It's all good, right? That expression of ours, it's all good. It is all good. It's all good. Now, Let me, let me just turn the corner a little bit and here say submission, resignation, thanksgiving are not really marks of a believer unless, and hear me on this, unless they are coupled with faith and trust and confidence in God's divine goodness. Do you understand? Let me read that again. Submission, 
resignation and thanksgiving are not really marks of a believer unless they're coupled with faith, trust, and confidence in God's divine goodness. You have to believe God is a good God and trust that these things are coming at you because God has your best in mind. Don't just endure suffering and grit your teeth and bear up under it. Embrace the reality that the suffering is actually God's best for you. Right? Romans 8, 28. God causes all things. Some things? All things to what? To work together for good to those who love him and who are the called according to his purposes. We tend to move past that on the front side. All things work together for good, we say. But we leave out those first couple of words. God causes all things to work together for good. They don't take him by surprise, beloved. He's causing them all to work together for good. Jesus rested in the Father's will for his life. Uh, for us, that is the only way we're ever going to avoid bitterness, contempt for what's happening to us. It's the only way we're going to keep our mouths silent in the midst of what may appear to be unjust suffering. We need to commit or entrust ourselves to him who judges righteously. Allow God to be your defender. Allow God to defend you. As I said, what, what this means is that we, we may need to redefine what good is. Good is what God chooses to call good, not what we think is good for us. It's kind of like your mom telling you you need to eat your peas. They're good for you. And you say, no, peas can't possibly be good for me. Yes, they are. I said they are. The greatest evil ever committed was what? The crucifixion of Christ. It was the greatest evil because the sinless son of God was killed as an innocent man. So it was not only the greatest evil, but it was also the greatest good. It proves the point, right? What we view as evil, God viewed as good. That's why we call it Good Friday. Do we think we know better than God? Have we become his counselors? Do you think you are wiser than him? that maybe you should dispense how life goes? Maybe you should plan it out? I could certainly do a better job than him, I'm sure. Beloved, uh, God help us if that is our thinking. Christ suffered sinlessly. He suffered silently. And finally, he suffered selflessly. You see that in verses 24 to 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. What can I say? We just sang three songs about it. Christ's work in our lives obviously required self-sacrifice on his part, right? Our salvation meant his death. Uh, he bore our sins, and if you think about that for just a moment, the sinless one, the one who had never known sin, never committed sin, bore all of the sin for all believers for all time. He bore it. He, he was struck because your sin required it. He suffered the agony of the cross because of your sin. He died a death you deserved to die. He didn't deserve it. And it says he did it for a purpose. 
that you might die to sin and live to righteousness. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians 5.21. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. He, that is God, made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And I, I don't want to do an exposition of this passage. It's, it's obviously talking about imputation. Our sin all went to him, and our deficit of righteousness, we got all of his righteousness. He lived a perfect, sinless life so that it could be credited to our account, and he got the better end of the deal, right? No. He got all of our sin in exchange for all of that righteousness. His selfless sacrifice was God's means of saving you. Through his death, you died. When he died, you died, and when he was raised, you were raised. It's the ultimate self-sacrifice. And notice the word bore uh, back in 1 Peter uh, 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. A bore is a, it's a sacrificial word. He took them upon himself. That's the point. Uh, it's right out of your Old Testament, Right? The high priest would lay his hands on the head of the animal and transfer the sins of the people onto that goat, right? And then they'd drive them off into the wilderness. Or they would slaughter the animal in place of the individual or sacrifice the blood in place of the sins of the people. It's the idea of he bore it on himself is the point. And I want to suggest to you that it was not the impending physical torture in the Garden of Gethsemane that wrenched his soul. It was the idea and the prospect of having all of our sin, the sin for all time from every individual who ever committed every little sin, placed on his back. So it's not only that he resisted his own sin, but he had to carry ours too. Never, never has any man suffered so greatly. It's the very definition of selflessness. Hebrews 9.28 So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. You know what that means? That means when he comes back, he's not going to have to deal with sin again because he already dealt with it once. That should be assurance for you, beloved, that your sins have already been dealt with. When he comes back, it's not going to be for sin again. It will have already been dealt with. Verse 24, he says, uh, By his wounds you were healed. And notice Peter flips back to the second person here. He's talking to the slaves again. And he's using a word that the wounds idea are the, the welts or the marks that would be left from a scourging. And he's saying, listen, uh, if anyone understands unjust suffering, it's your Savior. Okay? If anybody would understand what a slave must endure, it would be Christ. They would understand the terminology of stripes. Interestingly, though, this is a singular noun. It's a single mark. It, it, it means that it's referring to the ultimate mark made by the stroke of death. It's not multiple lashings we're talking about here. It's one strike, death, and the wealth that it left. He selflessly surrendered himself to death that we might live. You know that great passage in Philippians 2 that talks about Christ's humility of mind and, and uh, you know, that he emptied himself and, and took on the form of a man and was obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross, right? Well, it's preceded by an application there that we are to uh, 
love others more than ourselves. That's why it's there. It's an example. It's another example. Again, this is an obvious solution to Isaiah 53.5. Uh, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourgings we are healed. First uh, Peter uh, two twenty five. Notice the word for. The word for just means it's an explanation. And what he's saying is, listen, I'm going to get a little dramatic here, but you were like sheep that had left the pen. I mean, you, you guys wandered off. You put yourselves in harm's way, it, driven by dogs and, and wandering alone and falling into pits and, and bleeding, bleating with exposure and fatigue and easy prey for lions or wolves, certain to perish unless rescued by your shepherd, right? Peter says, you were going astray. The word here is wandering. It's, it's where we get the word planets from. They wander through the night sky. You guys were wandering. You're wandering like the planets through the night sky. You're, you're wandering out of the pen. You're going all over the place. You're getting yourself in harm's way. But, very strong contrast here, but you have been returned passively. This is a passive verb. You have been brought back. You have been returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. The Savior, in a, in a one-way rescue mission, uh, down the mountain, through the thorns, over the jagged rocks, seeking us till he found us, laid us over his shoulders, and brought us back to his care. He's the shepherd and the guardian of our souls. His life for ours, a rescue mission. Interestingly, if you look over at chapter 5, uh, this same expressions here, uh, these same expressions, shepherd and oversight, it's the word episkopos here, uh, overseer, and these are terms that are applied to the elders of the church. And the elders of the church are supposed to be examples to the flock in unjust suffering as well. That's the point. Whereas Christ is an example in chapter 2, the charge to the elders to be an example, but differently in this passage, it's a type. A type of suffering. Because you know why? If persecution comes to the church, who's going to get it first? They're going to drag off the leaders. Beloved, our stuff is all over the internet. They know what we believe here. There's no hiding from it. The charge to the elders is to be an example of how to act in the midst of unjust suffering. Beyond this, there are to be examples of selflessness by being willing to sacrifice themselves on behalf of the sheep. So how do you find strength to overcome unjust suffering in a godly way? Uh, again, I think the answer, James 4, 7, the answer is humility and it's obedience. It's humility and it's obedience. Uh, back to the Philippians 2 passage, have this attitude or mind in yourself that was also in Christ Jesus, right? Who, although he was in the form of God, he not, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. That's our example. That's our example. 1 Peter 4.19 uh, therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God, they shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Humility and obedience. God wants to see obedience even when it appears you're being treated unfairly. Christ suffered sinlessly. Christ suffered silently. Christ suffered selflessly. Now, these things are really only possible to the degree, you know, that we're walking in the Spirit. It, it, you try to do this stuff in the flesh, it's not going to work. You need to yield yourself to God's will and His Spirit. Hebrews 12.3 says, For consider Him who 
who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Why do you think they said that? Consider Christ and the way he endured hostility from sinners. Consider him. Look at his example. So why? So you won't lose heart and grow weary in well-doing. Beloved, it is easy to lose heart in the midst of unjust suffering. But we are to look to Christ, who is our example. The way that Christ endured hostility and suffering is an example and an encouragement to us so that we would not grow weary in well-doing, nor lose heart in the midst of our pain. So tonight, beloved, let's not mourn for our Savior. Let's rejoice in his sacrifice on our behalf, huh? And let's learn from his example of how to endure unjust suffering. Let's pray. Our Father, how we rejoice in the sacrifice of our Savior, in our shepherd and our overseer coming, our Father, to rescue us and leaving for us in the process an example of how to endure unjust suffering. Our Father, I know that trials and tribulations are a part of each one's lives, and I pray you would grant us the grace to not just grit our teeth and bear up under it, but to entrust ourselves to your sovereign care, knowing that you intend our good and your perfect will. Father, please help us to submit ourselves to it and to walk in obedience as your Spirit empowers us. We pray for Christ, our Savior's sake. Amen.